we're live. Hello, internet. Uh, my name is Jordan, and I am joined here with my co-host. Sir Lucian, welcome. Welcome. And I'm super nervous because I'm one of those YouTubers that hides behind editing, and now we're doing a live stream, and I've never done this before. <laughs> but basically, Sir Lucian and I, uh, we talk about D&D quite a bit, and we were thinking, why don't we record ourselves talking about D&D? So we decided to do a Saturday morning D&D show. Um, you guys can catch us 9 a.m. every Saturday. We're going to shoot for every Saturday. And if there's anything that changes scheduling-wise, if you follow us on Twitter, um, you will get notified with that. But basically, what this show is all about is we're going to kind of talk about the campaigns that we're running, about being a Dungeon Master, rules, questions, just kind of whatever's on our, on our minds for the week. And we're going to talk about it. We'll take questions in the chat if you guys are interested. Um, other than that, thank you guys so much for joining us and watching. Now, Sir Lucian... Or do you prefer Lucian? <laughs> uh, either is fine. Yeah, Lucian. You, yeah, you don't have to sir me. I'm Sir-er. not that old. No, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Lucian, you run how many games? Two, three games? Oh, yeah. Right now, I am running uh, three campaigns throughout Jeez. the week, and they alternate on different days. Um, and then I play in a couple just because as a DM, we all got to play. We mm-hmm. can't just be DMs. Um, so when you mentioned also the, the 9 o'clock um, time, that's going to be the Mountain Standard time. So for any of you that are going to do your time zone switches, you can figure that out. It's like 12 Eastern for me. And for any uh, European, uh, you guys will have to figure that out because I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, Master Lucian, maybe? No. Probably yeah. not. We'll stick with no, Lucian. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I run, um, I, and you're doing your, your games online, correct? Correct. That was what I thought was really cool about us getting together is from my angle, I'm doing a lot of Roll20 or virtual tabletop type role playing, although I have done some in person, though not as much, whereas your games are kind of like, you know, at your table, which is nice. Yeah, I've literally got a table over here to my left, and that's where we play. So I'm doing and I've only played in an online game with you. You ran a couple online games for us, and we're going to continue that in the future which is cool. So subscribe to our Twitters to figure out more of that. But um, in the future, like tomorrow, like tomorrow, we're probably going to be playing a game on this exact channel. If you want to check, check, check it out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so my games are at the table. Uh, your games are online. Are you also, are you playing anything at the table or are they all online? Even the games you're playing in? Currently, right now, all all online just to make it easier for scheduling. But like we played, uh, hosted at Gen Con, DM there with oh, a bunch fun. of random people, and then I had one in my dining room table, which is a Numenera campaign for a little bit. With um, we called it kind of the couples night out. It was all uh, couples that came and played some role playing. That's so fun. It was pretty fun. I am just getting into Numenera. Um, I'm trying to branch out from other role playing games. I've played. D&D, obviously, but we played um, a game of Deadlands my friend ran, which is like the Weird West, which was really fun. And now Numenera is kind of like on the horizon. But yeah, nice. let's, let's just dive in. What, is, what, what did you do in your games this week? Like what yeah, stuck that, out I mean, you? that's what the whole show's about. Yeah. Right? We wanted to talk really about what we did in D&D in the past week. And mm-hmm. so my Monday night was uh, my Storm King's Thunder campaign. I'm running a full module. My friends came to me and said, we want to play D&D 5th edition. They rolled three five players, and they said, we want to play an official module. So we chose Steam Storm King's Thunder. We've been in it. We're in episode 53 at this point and monday night's group got to fight a spider queen spider swarm they're in the eye of uh the all father trying to get some information if anybody's familiar with that we won't do too many spoilers so if you are playing that don't worry about hearing it um they were able to fight something i'd never seen before called a remoraz i don't know if you fought one of those before I they're pretty not. cool yeah our barbarian almost got swallowed whole and died that was really exciting <laughs> but they they were able to save him uh, so um, it must be a big creature, like yeah, it's kind of like uh, or... <laughs> maybe like an ice centipede, something that okay. hides in the snows, <laughs> waiting for, and it's like enormous, like the size of a, a medium dragon or something, nice. of the size even bigger than like a giant. So I'd never seen one before. It came up in the module, and I thought, oh, this is so cool. Um, so that was pretty good. And then Thursday night is here's the funny thing. In this campaign, I'm running two groups in the same campaign during the same timeline. 
So the third, the, the second group is in a different area, and they were fighting Uthgart barbarians of the Griffin tribe. They're on their way to uh, meet a place, but we had our brand new player join, Christian, who's playing Rex the Pirate Fighter. He joined <laughs> our show so that we have, you know, four and four in each of the groups. They're going to come together for big battles. And uh, one of the cool things that happened in that game was, this was funny, we had a, a, one of our players is playing a bard down to six hit points. There was two archers firing arrows at them, so they decided mm -hmm. they didn't want to get hit. They looked for partial cover, which only gave them plus two to AC. But they said, hey, what if I go prone? And that was a cool little idea, because if you go prone, ranged combat's disadvantage, which is really cool. So, But she got hit one more time by an arrow, so she was down to three hit points. So the next turn, she comes up to me, and she says the funniest thing I've, I've heard yet in one of my sessions. She asked me, can I put half of my body in the bag of holding? <laughs> I'm guessing to get more cover, right? Yeah, for and cover, Because like, right? there's half yeah, cover, yeah. there's full cover, there's quarter cover and stuff, and that yeah. gives you a bonus to AC. Yeah, so I had to figure out on the fly, which is what this show's about also, is like D&D &D people, dungeon masters, game masters, running into on the fly, players coming up with just some fantastic ideas. Mm -hmm. So I gave her inspiration for such a great idea, but I, I really thought the bag of holding in my point of view was it's either in or it's out, you know, because it's a magical portal going to a magical space. But I liked what you said, because when I told you that story a little bit earlier, we were talking yeah. uh, yesterday. Tell your story, because I think that was really funny. Yeah. Too. So similar thing happened is in my game, my well, there's a ranger, a beast ranger that's got um, uh, the, the beast pet and it's a fake corgi. So we kind of reskinned the mastiff to be this like giant corgi that she can run around uh, as a mount. So she hops on this corgi and she has a mount that is a fake corgi and they were scaling a tower um, and they got like grapple hooks and things and they were climbing up ropes, but they realized, you know, corgi's got short little stubby legs and can't climb the tower and they couldn't hold it because it was just too big. So what were they going to do? And they asked if they could put it in the bag of holding. And I said, well, there's no oxygen in the bag of holding. So there's a chance that he could suffocate and take damage. Um, but they were like, well, no, 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 we'll hit just his body and we'll keep his head out. And so I was like, um, yeah, why not? Because I didn't, I couldn't think of how else they were going to get this Corgi up this, this tower. And it was just one of those things where like, yeah, I'll give it to you. It was smart. So they ha hoisted this, this dog up, um, from the, the scruff of its neck, basically, um, half inside a, uh, a bag of holding so yeah his like little dog head popping out the top yeah i can't wait to see the fan art on something like that that would be <laughs> really funny for that character in fact that should be the character should be their their character portrait should have that because that's just super funny no for sure so that was pretty good um so that was a bag of holding thing where we talked a lot. Uh, one thing that I kind of fell into in the last couple of um, weeks with this campaign it, to keep an eye on for Game Masters, Dungeon Masters, and such. If you're running two groups, it's the first time I've done this in the same campaign during the same timeline, I'm having a little difficulty keeping them all at the same point of the timeline mm -hmm. when somebody misses a session because of the holidays. The Thursday oh. crew missed a session. So now it was almost like a month before they played versus the Monday crew made their session, so they're further ahead. So you just got to keep that in mind if you're going to try to host some type of um, linked campaign like that. Yeah. Are keep they really in, good track of timeline. Are they in different uh, parts of the world? Like, could they meet? Yeah. Is that kind of the idea? Oh, they started this half. We only split the group last month at the beginning of December. They were all together. I was running a... They were all together as a seven-person party. Oh, okay. And I, it was way too much to try to roll a run on roll 20 and keep the yeah. sessions to a lower combats were taken too long. So I wanted to split them a little bit. So we did the cardinal rule. We split the party. Four of them went <laughs> north into the spine of the world of Forgotten Realms. Yeah. And the other four are heading to the Star Metal Hills over near Long Saddle to do a separate quest. Now, what they're both doing, they know each other. They have a stone. They can talk to each other. And the idea is... Um, one of the group is going to get some items that they think they're going to need to fight the giants, and the other group is going to talk to an oracle to get more information. Okay. So they have their own missions, and then if a big battle happens, I can bring them together for a big battle session, all eight players, because Roll20 can handle that. We can have some epic stuff. But for the other, for most part, I can do four. And the other reason I did that is it's hard if you have six, eight, ten players to try to tie in backstory for people. There's oh, not yeah. enough time. You have enough time to do the adventure. You have enough time to just 
run the thing, but you don't have enough time to say, hey, your character's long lost father just showed up and now let's play that out because there's just too many players going on. So when we split it to four, I felt like that was going to happen. It's an experiment, so we'll see. Yeah, no, I think it's really cool. I like the idea of... Um, well, obviously, I like the idea of the Forgotten Realms because I have my Forgotten Realms Explained YouTube channel. But um, that the world is there's multiple adventures kind of going on in that world all the time, and that's really cool that these guys can talk to each other and they've kind of got the same goals, but they're in different parts of. I'm, I'm, you know, you could look at a map and say I'm here, they're currently here. Like that's really cool. I yeah. also don't think that I could do more than. F- like I have five players at my table and we've talked about adding a sixth player. Cause I have one guy that really wants to join us, but I'm trying to convince him to just start a new campaign. Like yeah, I know his name's Sir Lucian. I really yeah. want to join that game. <laughs> but no, we have, we have five players and me. Um, so, and then he wants to play a really bad, but when you get to that point where you have like six or seven people at a table, it almost makes more sense to say, can somebody else DM a game? And then you can grab like three or four people from this table. And then we can just have two games going simultaneously. But I get the feeling that he really wants to play more than he wants to DM. And I don't know if I'm up for DMing two games a week just because of like the YouTube channel and work and and now this and a bunch of other stuff. It's like, man, because I don't know how you do it. Like you're, constantly gaming and which no, is I'm, awesome I'm, but yeah. yeah i think it's funny because the way we we kind of had met we were to me we were dungeon masters who've started within the last couple years yeah so that's that's the experience that we have so we're not the guys that have been running games for 20 oh, yeah. years through all the additions so and that's what a lot of people coming into the hobby are right now they're newer they want to they're looking for videos or looking for places especially like your channel with forgotten realm stuff to say i'm about to run something here we go and i'm new to this and that's kind of our experience so that's our stuff and i just think that I'm a glutton. I'm the person who said, God, I'm so into it right now. I can't say no. So I've got like mm-hmm. three campaigns running. I'm trying to do one shots. Like this week alone, there's going to be four shows on D&D because there was two Storm Kings Thunder, today's show, tomorrow's uh, McLancy Waddle one shot that we're doing with yeah. other YouTubers like you and, and uh, Magpie Random and PB Plays Inside and Greybeard's Tavern. They're all come together on a really cool group. And that's we're only running every now and then. Next week is I play in Dark Tides. Um, And then I'm going to play in an adventure league on Tuesday. And then I'm going to host a West Marches style Borderlands game on Thursday. I'm just crazy. Yeah. Don't do what I'm doing. (laughs) Don't do what I'm doing. Everybody says you're going to get burned out, but I'm having so much fun. So I have a question for you because um, I've watched the Matt Colville stuff about West Marches. I'm still confused about what a West Marches game is. Like, can, since, can you tell me, like, what exactly constitutes a West Marches yeah. game? Yeah, it was a style of game created. Um, it was so funny because I, you know who taught me this was Matt Colville, which yeah. is really kind of, I think, how I, I, we were fans. Me and you are fans of Matt Colville. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I think was, I hear you talking about him all the time. I talk about him. And that's why I even reached out. And I thought, ah. So he was talking about it. And in the way I understand it, it was a style of play that was developed by a certain person, which you can find online. But it was the idea of it being more of a sandbox game. Mm-hmm. instead of a module written adventure. Um, and there were some caveats to it that made it so that you could drop in and drop out. And it put the onus on the players to organize themselves and tell the DM, okay, we can all get together on Friday night. Are you free? The DM would say, let me look at my calendar. Yes, I'm free. We're running a game. But other than that, if the players don't come to them and you can have multiple groups in the same world, it's a usually a world that's open sandbox but unexplored, so they don't really know what's there or what's mm-hmm. going on. No storylines in the town, um, and they go out and they hex crawl. So a hex crawl is you have covered hexes mm-hmm. that you've already mapped out as a DM, and then as they explore them, you they uncover them, they come back, and they tell everybody, and then other groups can either go out there again and look, or they can go in a different direction and find more stuff out. So it's a way to play a sandbox style Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's more emphasis on the players. Like I would go to you and say, Hey, this week we want to explore grid section beta five. And yeah, you'd be yeah, like, we're okay, I'll this, prep yep, we're beta this five. Far. So Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah, that's it. cool. Awesome. Well, what else is going on in your game before we like jump over to me? Because I don't want to talk about myself just yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh 
Yeah, and I'm every now and then when I'm not looking at Jordan through the camera, it's just because I'm watching chat over on my other monitor. So oh, that's, yeah. I'm just no watching, the, and I see uh, <laughs> a couple of questions out there. And I do know Stephen Lumpkin is the one that probably popularized it, but I know he got it from another person. There's another person who um, actually developed it and created that style. Oh, okay. Um, but other than that, um, so yeah, so D and D wise, I know next week we have stuff coming up. Which Dark Tides is a if you're into the Black Company kind of books. I'm playing a war mage from the new Xanathar's Guide. Oh, so I nice. got to make a character. Um, in fact, on my channel, you can see I did a video, probably too long because it's about an hour, but how to make a D&D 5e character. During that video, the example I'm making is a war mage, which I then use in the Dark Tides campaign, which I'm having a ton of fun about a wizard who's in the front lines, a wizard who uses... Yeah. Um, buffing ability to stay in the fight, help the people that are around them, but is not the sit in the back glass cannon kind of guy. So that's kind of fun and um, that we've been playing. Um, and then the Borderlands game is a new group of friends that came to me and said, "Oh, we'd love to play." So I got a couple of my friends together and we're gonna and we're playing that. They just got to the town, so they had a three month sale from the Sword Coast. I, I moved them all the way past, uh, what is it called, Evermeet is the big mm -hmm. island way over. But then there's another one even farther over that basically is like the America continent. Oh, above, Mestica, yeah. But it's above Mestica because like I think oh, right, Me right. Mestica is to the south and there's something to the north. I forget yeah. off the top of my head. Um, so they are there. That's where they've landed. And I've created this hex map doing it the way that Matt Colville showed on his Collaborus videos that he showed. Um, so I'm building a, a thing there. They... Uh, last week, this we can even say for last week because we didn't have a show, um, they went to a temple. They got attacked by a swarm of spiders, nearly killed the fighter in one mm. shot. The <laughs> first level characters against a swarm. Now, the CR rating says it's only a half, right? So a group of four yeah. characters, first level, fight a CR creature of half. No big deal, right? You would think. Those swarm spiders hit that fighter and put him down in one shot, and the whole party about freaked out. Those they early pulled it levels, out. <laughs> those early levels are scary. Like once you get to like four or five, you're pretty okay. But but man, it's rough to stay alive those early levels in fifth edition. Yeah, and I'm sure in one of our shows we'll talk about how we're creating encounters and CR levels yeah. and how that works with our groups. But so that's pretty good. They got to a temple, they cleansed it of some um, some. Kind of, they don't know what's happening in it yet, but it was rotten. The water was um, uh, unsanctified, so one of the clerics sanctified it, uh, and it's it's going really good. They all had a ton of fun, and I thought it was really good first level adventure for them. So cool. That's that's been me. We got to hear from you now, though. Um. Well, so I'm running Tomb of Horrors. Uh, my homebrew game. It was on hi hiatus, so uh, uh, one of my players basically was out for the month of like half of November and December. And so in order to like play something, I gathered a bunch of people together and, or my regular group plus one extra person to kind of replace her and say, Hey, do you want to run tomb of horrors? And they were like, yeah, that's great. Um, and it's been like a learning experience. Um, cause tomb of horrors is a different, like I, I ran white plume mountain from tales of the yawning portal. And that was a lot of fun. And that was just kind of like running an adventure and them having a fun time with an adventure. But, uh, tomb of horrors is just punishing. Like there are just unfriendly, like not fair instances in that game. Uh, so the last little bit of my game, they have gotten really lucky. They've been running around to... Um, cause the, the module is kind of like, like, here's a dead end that could kill you. And here's a secret door that continues into the, into the dungeon. And here's another dead end that could kill you. And here's a secret door and here's not a dead end, but the secret door takes you someplace that could kill you. They like went through, and I don't know if it was just blind luck, but like, well, it's gotta be blind luck for the most part, but they walk <laughs> in and they're just like, well, I'm pretty sure I should look for secret doors. And I'm like, and you find it. And so then they go to like the correct door and then they find the other one. They're like, uh, we should probably look for secret doors again. And I'm like, and you find it again. So they went through, but they know that they left back all of these other unexplored areas that they were just like, oh, and I've, I've got one player that really wants to know the whole dungeon. Like he's not content with just finishing the dungeon. Like he wants to map out every little bit of it. 
Um, and actually it's part of his character because his character has a cartography background and wants to like, and was basically hired by his church. He's a cleric hired by his church to map out the tomb of horrors. So my party got to a section where there is, um, a genie and they ended up freeing the genie. Um, it, again, it was like another 50, 50. If you rocked his bottle around too much, or if you kind of examined it or shook it, the genie would come out and attack them. But if you gently take off the topper, then the genie comes out and grants wishes. Uh, nice. so again, they lucked out there. So they got three wishes. The first wish, um, they were all kind of talking to each other and there's a lot of loot in this room, too much for them to carry. And they were saying, well, should we wish for, uh, bags of holding and i had my genie go oh you wish for bag of bags of holding and i gave them all bags of holding so then they were like oh we got to be really careful with our words about how we interact with this genie they knew that they're going to fight a serac at some point who's the demi lich in the tomb of horrors so they asked for a resistance to necrotic damage so now they're all oh, just nice. kind of like resistant to necrotic damage which i thought was smart and then finally, they didn't know how to get out of the dungeon. They thought they were locked into this room. Uh, and so they wished to get out of the tomb so they could kind of like resupply. So that's where we're at right now. Like they left the tomb, they went back in or they resupplied. They kind of like bought some more healing potions. They got a good night's rest and they went in and they decided to explore different areas. And I finally had my first, like I killed a player in Dungeons and Dragons for the first time thanks to Tomb of Horrors. But yes. I should have killed somebody like I wish I had recorded some of these sessions. But like if you go back or if I if you blah, 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 blah this is live. I'm really good at words, <laughs> but I should have recorded some of these sessions because there's so many times where I'm like, oh, I'm going to kill them this week. Nope, nope. They all survived. They're like, oh, this trap's going to kill them for sure. Nope. They bypassed that trap. So this was the first time that they opened a door and the door spits out sleeping gas. And the elf cleric, um, that's kind of the cartographer of the group, he fell asleep or not asleep. He was unconscious because that we had to determine that because he's like, well, I'm re I can't go to sleep because I'm an elf. And I'm like, well, the gas says it turns you unconscious. And he's like, okay, well, I can be unconscious, but I can't be asleep. So we had to define yeah. that. Um, the same time that he fell asleep, this giant like steamroller comes out of the wall and just starts creeping slowly towards them. So the idea is if that if they all fail their saves, they get rolled over by the steamroller. They pulled him out of the way because he was the only one that fell asleep. The steamroller like finished its little path and then backed up to where it, it started. And the thief of all people, the rogue, he walked up and he said, um, well, I want to like examine it because I want to see like how it moves or if we can like drive it around or something. And I'm like, okay, the minute that you're there, more gas comes billowing in and he failed his save, fell, as <laughs> fell unconscious. And as he falls unconscious, like after the gas, this thing starts rolling and he was right in front of it. So we oh, rolled boy. initiative and I'm like, can you guys get there in, um, your 30 feet of movement? And they couldn't. So he got rolled over and it says in the module, like there is no forgiveness. They're dead. Like all of their possessions are crushed oh. and gone. So I finally killed somebody and <laughs> it was crazy. But that was the funny thing because in, for the very first time in storm King's thunder, we ran across a part that had a trap uh -huh. and it was a giant boulder that come rolling down a hallway in Indiana the giant Jones thing. Style. And, it, and it flattened, <laughs> Two of our players just crushed him. Yeah. It was hilarious. Yeah. So, and I overprepared my players. I kind of talked about this. I made a tube of horrors video on my YouTube channel that you can check out. But, um, and I'm going to do a part two once I finish Tomb of Horrors. But that, I overprepared them on how much death was going to happen. So at the beginning of the tomb, I said that there's a bunch of cults, there's vendors, there's all these people that are kind of like, we found the tomb of horrors, but we're too scared to like, check it out. We're looking for adventures. So that's how they're able to like resupply and buy stuff. Cause there's all these vendors. And one of the items that they could buy was um, for a lot of money. Like it was most of their money to buy this, but it was a, a bracelet that gave them three lives. So I called it a soul bracelet that spit, split their soul into three different um, yeah, basically split their soul into three. So if they do die, they can come back. So for fortunately for this rogue, he died, but then one of his soul gems kind of just like broke and then his body was reconstituted back into 
um, himself so he could still play. But nice. props to my player because he totally played it up. Like he was scared of doors after that. Um, there was another area with some mist and he refused to go in because he's like, I won't deal with smoke anymore because that's what killed me <laughs> uh, and totally played it up. Yeah, so, post-traumatic syndrome for yeah. the character. That's great. And where we left off is, um, and I don't. Hopefully, my players aren't watching this. Don't watch this, players. Go away. Don't but, hold your ears. <laughs> cover your ears. But they're they found um, a dummy a Sarak. So there's like a, an undead creature that claims to be a Sarak, so that the players will you know not loot the tomb. So they found him. We rolled initiative, and that's where we called it for the night. So tomorrow when we play, they're gonna fight that guy. And I think finish the tomb. I always say that. I feel like we're going to finish the tomb. And then they, we always goof off and just chat too much so that we don't actually finish the Tomb of Horrors. What I'm worried about, though, is the actual Aserak fight. Because they're level 11. And I did the math for how tough um, Aserak is. And that's like a beyond deadly encounter. Like, I don't think they have a chance of winning. Which is weird because... Some of some players will see that as a challenge, but other players, I think, will just be like, well, that's not fair. Like, if we don't even yeah. have a chance, why are we playing the Tomb of Horrors? Um, and that's ultimately what my next video is going to be about. And probably the next time we do Saturday morning D&D show, I'll talk about it. Because is it, and I don't know, that's a good question for you too. Like, is that fair or is that what the module intends? Like, they're supposed to fail. Um, because if there's not a yeah. chance of success, that doesn't seem fun. And so that's where I'm, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's one of those because there's so many different modules out there that you can play that give you different game styles. And that one sounds a little more hardcore maybe than other modules yeah. you can play. So I think it comes down to like who's at your table and really from a DM standpoint, for me, I think it's up to us to make sure we set the expectations of what they're playing. Like, so if these are people that want to play these characters for a very long time, they want to really get into the backstory, right. then something that they have no way to succeed at at all is going to crush that group. But the group that says, hey, we're only playing this for a couple of weeks. These are kind of right. fun characters, but we didn't, you know, they're, they, we started at level 10 anyways. Yeah. Maybe that type of thing. Then it turns it into more of a mechanical, how do we get past it when it's super hard, even if we all die? So I think it just depends. And that's... Actually, exactly what I did. So we had the option because my homebrew game, the characters are level nine. And I was like, well, we could bump you to level 10 and you could play Tomb of Horrors with those guys, or we could make new characters. And they kind of like the idea of new characters because it's fun to make new characters. So they're not overly attached to these guys, but I, I don't know. It's, it's going to be a weird, it's going to be a weird fight. I just feel like overall, because yeah. it's so one-sided that. I don't know. Maybe my mentality is is that I need to have fun, and if if the DM is having fun, maybe it'll reciprocate and they'll have fun, as opposed to me being like, "I'm really sorry that I have to do this to you guys, but yep, you fail again," or like, "Yep, you're dead," <laughs> or "Sorry, I know you did 30 points of damage to him, but he life drains you for 25 points of damage and heals that," and it's just yeah. like, oh, "Are you serious? Like, what are we supposed to do?" But then on the other hand, my players always surprise me. Like in our homebrew game, I always throw a monster at them and I'm like, this is gonna be the one that I'm gonna kill somebody. Like this is gonna be the toughest fight. And then they just like clean up and mop the floor with it. And like we were talking earlier, like early levels are super dangerous and you can die yes. really, really easy. But now my players are level nine and they don't, and they've got magic items. They've got healing potions. I mean, they actions, bonus actions, bonus, surging yeah. actions. Yeah, like just at a, I didn't realize this, but at level eleven, the fighter gets three attacks with taking the attack action. Yeah. So if you're a dual wielding fighter, every round you get to attack four times. Yeah, and at, then they're haste him. So yeah. then you double all that exactly. stuff. Exactly, oh, and so crazy. all of a sudden you yeah. just like now I get to do eight attacks in one round, and that is or not eight, but seven attacks in one round. And that is mind boggling. Like, yeah. I don't know. So players at higher levels, I need to I need to start throwing more deadly encounters rather than just hard encounters. Because hard encounters, I don't think is gonna challenge my group anymore, but deadly encounters are. And then if I feel like it's a little unbalanced, I can always pull back from that, but it's harder to push it forward. Like right. if I've already established that this character does 2d8 damage, he can't miraculously start doing like 4d8 damage, you know? 
Yeah. Um, but and if I, think I start newer... at 48, I could say like, oh, you maimed his arm, like his arm's broken. So now he does half the damage that he normally does or yeah. 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 And I think as newer DMs, we're used to running people at certain levels. We, we understand how to play first, second, third levels, maybe fourth and fifth, but I'm super new to running somebody at seventh, eighth, ninth level, yeah. tenth level, high level games. Or and that's not even high level. That's high level to me. That's mid level. Eventually, we'll be running people that are doing level seventeen characters, level yeah. eighteen characters. And how do you you know how do you prepare for that? So you know, as a new DM or GM out there getting into the system, don't be intimidated by that because it takes so long to get there. Anyways, oh yeah, just jump in and play. Just get those first few levels out because those are super fun. Anyways. And don't rush through them, you know? Take your time and really enjoy those yeah. levels. Oh, no, for sure. This campaign's been, my homebrew campaign has been two years, two and a, yeah, two years, and now we're level nine. So it's taken us, yeah. and that's that's slow. Like, if people played multiple times a week, like, we play three times a month on average. So, um, oh, I was going to say something and I forgot now. It was about high-level characters. So being... They can do so many things. Like magic at higher levels blew me away. So in Tomb of Horrors, there was a whole bunch of traps that my my players bypassed by just using the fly spell. They're like, oh, yeah. well, we'll just cast fly on us and then we'll go over all of these and not set off any of those traps. And I'm like, well, they're burning spell slots, so at least I'm taking something away from them for these traps, you know? And then the cleric has a spell where once per long rest, they can effectively... Um, and I say effectively because if you do it multiple times, it doesn't work as well. But they can commune with their god and ask a question on a, a path or a direction. Like, should I open this box? Should I go through this door? Is this going to hurt me? Is this going to do something else? And you can answer like, this is a good thing. This is a bad thing. This is a good and bad thing. Or it's unclear. And yeah. my players use that spell a couple times too, just to know like, okay, we don't know if this door is trapped. We don't know if this chest is trapped and what's going to happen if I open this. And for example, they used it on the genie. Like they, they were, they went and he prayed and he's like, should we open this bottle? Is it good, bad or indifferent? And I'm like, nope, I have to be honest with you. Like, it's a pretty good thing. It's a genie that's going to grant you wishes. So I don't know. It's high level magic can do a lot. And it's interesting as a DM to figure out like, how do you bypass that? And the yeah. Tomb of Horrors specifically has rooms in it that are like, these are anti-magic rooms to kind of prevent high level magic from ruining that trap or that discovery, you know? Right, yep, that makes sense. It's gonna be fun to really see where these uh, adventures take us. Cause those are two Wizards of the Coast released adventures that yeah. we're both playing. And then we both have some homebrew stuff that's going yeah. on. So it's just fun to contrast kind of both of the styles, I think. Well, cool. Um, I think we're at our, like we said, we're going to do a 30 minute show. We're at about 30 minutes. Yeah. I think if, uh, the do you have any final we'll, thoughts? we'll do a few of these and if the audience thinks, you know, we should go longer, I mean, we certainly could. We just thought that 30 minutes was right, right about the right time. Yeah. So give us feedback on the show, the format, things that you want to hear us talk about, uh, you know, and then come see our other shows. Uh, that's probably all I had. Yeah. You can check me out on YouTube, um, youtube.com slash Jordan with a silent PH in the middle. So, uh, yeah, you can search for Sir Lucian on YouTube and then the Twitch is also forward slash Sir Lucian. And then eventually Jordan's also going to be streaming too. We're getting to that. Yeah. So we'll see that. My uh, internet is awful. Um, and so <laughs> once I upgrade it, I'll be able to actually stream. Cause I tried streaming once and it was like, yeah, it was so choppy and just not fun. But eventually, we'll we'll be streaming both on Twitch and YouTube, and that sounds like it'll be a lot of fun. So thank yeah, you guys yeah. for watching. Yeah. Like I know this was we were we were like full disclosure we were gonna not do it this weekend. Like because last night we were talking about it and we're like you know I don't think we have a lot of this stuff done. Uh, like the the layout that you're looking at right now, like yeah. that wasn't done, and it's just kind of like so maybe we'll we'll hold off a week. But then we stayed up really late and finished all the stuff we needed <laughs> <Yeah>. to do <laughs> um, in order to, like, make this happen. And so when we woke up this morning, we're like, well, it's all done. Like, why don't we, why don't we just try and air the show? And so, yeah, this is kind of just off the top of our heads. We were like, let's stream and talk yeah, about yeah. D&D. Yeah, welcome to our unscripted D&D &D show yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs>
So, and I want to thank you, Mr. Lucian, for having this great idea. And it's been a lot of fun to collaborate with you and kind of get it off the ground. And now we have a show. So be sure to tune in uh, 9 a.m. Pacific every Saturday morning for the Saturday morning D&D show. Um, and we should be pretty strict on that if anything changes. Yeah, it'll be Saturdays for sure. It might be like yeah. an hour later or an hour before, but it'll be Saturdays for sure. So yeah, just check out the social medias for any changes. Yeah. And thanks, guys. I will see you all next Saturday. And I will see you too next Saturday, Mr. Lucian. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. And we'll yeah. see you in the next show. Bye. Bye.